Dr. Kornobis, thank you so much for taking the time to come into VOA and talk to us. Well, thank you so very much. And it's just a blessing to be with the best. It's an honor to have and you that's here. You. Thank that's you. you. I appreciate that. Back in uh, September, uh, you wrote in a tweet, I stand in deep solidarity with my precious Iranian brothers and sisters fighting the terror and trauma of the oppressive and repressive Islamic regime in Iran. I have many lovely Iranian relatives who are struggling in this ugly situation. Many loved it, uh, but some of your followers criticized you for participating in a U.S. government disinformation campaign. What is your response to them? Well, I've always viewed myself as trying to take a moral and spiritual stand. And Brother Martin King used to say, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I want to be in consistent solidarity with all of my brothers and sisters, no matter what nation, no matter what color, no matter what gender, no matter what sexual orientation. If they're suffering, if they're being oppressed and repressed, I stand in solidarity with them. And so one always finds oneself, of course, being criticized from different, different camps. You know, you stand with the Dalits, you stand with the Native Hawaiians, you stand with the Palestinians, you stand with the Jews, you stand with the landless peasants in Brazil. You're going to be criticized, but it's a, it's a moral and spiritual question for me. It's a matter of um, trying to keep track of the precious dignity of each and every human being made in the image of God. And in October, you tweeted, uh, the historic woman-led revolutionary insurgency in Iran deserves our deep solidarity. This brilliant and powerful piece by my beloved uh, wife tells undeniable truth and gives genuine hope. Uh, the oppression in Iran is nothing new to you. It's not a new phenomenon to you. I've seen that you talked about the uh, Baha'is persecution for a long time. Maybe it goes back to many years ago. Uh, but how big of an influence uh, your wife has been uh, on you to have the right perception of what is actually right now going on in Iran? Well, there's no doubt that it's a beautiful thing to be married to such a magnificent uh, person, my wife, uh, Anahita Madavi West. You know, her father, Mehdi Madavi, was one of the great students of the great Nima. Uh, Nima, one of the greatest poets of really the 20th century, won't get into that right now. But uh, there's no doubt that uh, uh, her example has been a tremendous inspiration for me. I would say this, though, that from the very beginning for me, I've always believed that uh, Persians were a great people, a world historical people. I think that Persian poetry is the very heart and soul of Iranian people in the same way that jazz, the blues, the spirituals, is the heart and souls of black people. And so I think the gift of poetry to the world is one that's had an impact on all of us. And for me, the idea of trying to keep track of that kind of creativity, that kind of imagination, as it is expressed in resistance against any form of oppression, it could be the Shah, going back to August 1953, the coup. It could be the overthrowing of a democratic project by the United States and in the UK. It could be oppression under uh, the clergy of the mullahs. All repression, oppression needs to be radically called into question and resistance and resilience is something that we need to accent. And so yes, I, I appreciate the, uh, the tremendous uh, love and support of, of, of Anahita, Dr. Professor. Anahita Madhavi West, oh, very, very much so indeed. I wish you had a chance to meet her magnificent mother, Mersama. Oh, I'm telling you, or oh, Antigon, oh, her, her sister, Bo, her brother. We can go on and on. Yeah, we're really blessed to have her in our community. Uh, so later you and Anahita joined the conversation as we just we were talking about it with uh, Socrates uh, Cafe, Christopher Cafe. Uh, you talked about the same uh, issue. You also raised the issue in your talk at uh, Marymount Institute. I watched the clip of it that mm. you talked about that. So now, after uh, almost four months of uh, ongoing protest, uh, the uprising in Iran, what is your current understanding of what is happening in Iran? You know, it's hard to say because the, um, the, the, the press hasn't really covered 
this heroic struggle of our young, precious and priceless sisters and brothers in Iran the way it ought. So it's hard to know exactly what's going on. And you know the government in place, Islamic Republic, uh, is trying to curtail and distort what's going on. But what seems to me to be happening is first this magnificent wave of young people, beginning with our dear Kurdish sister's death, and then the general strike. And it's, it's escalating, and there's a real possibility of some fundamental change in Iran. There really is. There's real possibility. Uh, one just hopes and prays that a leadership can emerge that is effective enough to channel the righteous indignation. And that righteous indignation is legitimate. I mean, you just cannot treat any human beings the way precious Iranians are being treated today. And that's true in any society. See, I say that as a black person in America. You see, trying to deal with white supremacy and predatory capitalist processes in, in the states. Uh, uh, and so I, 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 I don't know. I, I can't give in any way a, um, a definitive analysis. But the fact that you shoot down the precious young people, 14 years old, 15 years old, no society somehow can get away with doing that for long. Even if, for a moment, it looks as if they can get away with it. They cannot. You're going to reap what you sow. And so the question becomes, how do, does one come up with institutions and with leaders? Because part of the problem of, of the great uh, 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 project of Iran is that you have the most glorious and magnificent heritage and you have such a sad and treacherous history at the same time. You, know, <laughs> you got Rumi, Sadid, Hafez, and Farouk, Farouk Zahad, and all of these towering figures. And then you end up with these leaders, the Shah, Khomeini. What's going on? Where's the translation of this magnificent spirit and courage and imagination when it comes to political structures? Now, this is true for nations across the world, but this is especially true for people who've given us the greatest poetry that the human species has seen. Now, of course, I can say the same thing about the United States. You know, we don't have a leadership close to John Coltrane, close to Aretha Franklin, close to Louis Armstrong, close to Duke Ellington, and we haven't even got to, to, uh, to Luther Vandross yet. So our artists, who are in many ways the vanguard of the species, our musicians, who are in many ways the vanguard of our movement, that they set a high standard of spiritual and moral greatness in the sense that they give of themselves. See, that's what Nima did. He gave of himself and said, I'm going to find the dignity in the everyday language and speech of ordinary people, even given the legacies of the Rumis and the Hafez and the Sadis as high as it gets. Even the Europeans have to acknowledge they bow down. Goethe, Emerson bows down to those poets. You see what I mean? How do we translate that kind of energy? into our political structure, political leadership. And I think in many ways, even the leaders in the diaspora here of, of, of when it comes to uh, Iranians, that they've got to be more jazz-like. They got to learn how to lift every voice and listen and mediate what they hear with an attempt to overlap so that they can come up with a collective expression rather than at each other's throats, and that's exactly what happens in a jazz orchestra, right? Each voice is raised, not just echoes, but voices raised, bouncing off against others. The dead as well as the living to do what? To keep the focus on something bigger than them. The suffering, right now the suffering in Iran. How do we address the suffering? Fascinating. Uh, you mentioned the uh, death of uh, shooting uh, 14, 15 years old uh, um, kid in Iran. Uh, the, what sparked the civil rights movement was the lynching of a 14-year-old uh, boy uh, 
Do you see similarities between the civil rights movement, uh, the struggle of people, and what is happening as you were just describe, uh, describing uh, in Iran? Well, there's no doubt that uh, Emmett Till in August of 1955 was the real, uh, real catalyst for the movement. There's no doubt about that. Uh, uh, I think that what happens it, it then with the emergence of the response to Emmett Till, you remember his mother takes him back to Robert Temple's Church of God in Christ in San Francisco, keeps that coffin open, you see his head is five, time, five times the size of his ordinary head. People say, this is the worst of America. There is the best of America. That's going to be Martin King. That's going to be Rosa Parks. That's going to be Rabbi Joshua, uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. That's going to be Dorothy Day. But the worst of it is here. Look at the victim of this terror. So it is in Iran. And remember Birmingham, when Martin Luther King says, I'm going to organize thousands of children. The children come together with Martin. What does he say to them? He said, put on your cemetery clothes and get coffin ready. And the parents are saying, what are you talking about, Martin? You're talking about our children being killed? This is all that we have. I'm not crazy about this, but they're willing to do it. And what did they do? They fill the jails with thousands of children in Birmingham. Now, of course, at the same time, those, those four, four, four girls were killed in 16th Street Baptist Church, right? So the same kind of thing happening with these vicious executions and deaths uh, on behalf of the, um, uh, of, of, of the government right now, of the Islamic Republic. Uh, the, the, the mularchy, the, uh, the oligarchs who are running uh, Iran right now. But at the same time, what we had in black America was we had a leadership in place, you see. And we had a leadership in place that was open to a variety of different perspectives. See, Martin had to deal with the NAACP. The NAACP is not a revolutionary organization, but it's very important. He had to deal with the Urban League. Not revolution, but very important. Then he had to deal with Stokely Carmichael. Revolutionary. Then he later on had to deal with the Black Panther Party. Revolutionary. How do we get overlap? We're never going to get unanimity. No. We don't want unanimity. We want diversity in unity. We want a variety of voices coming together such that we can connect and relate to each other even as we have disagreements on different levels. What we do agree on is what? The suffering in Iran must stop. We're going to do everything we can to, to stop it. But then you've got different ideologies and different perspectives and lenses and so forth. Now, at the same time, you know, in the United States, we also uh, we had some, some, some elites from the establishment that were open. You see, in Iran, you're going to have to have some conflict among your clergy. You're going to have some dissensus. You're going to have some dissenters among the elites in the Islamic Republic who say, this has gone far enough. I've gone this far with the Islamic Republic. I will not go further. Quit killing these kids. Quit, 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 quit imposing these kind of coercive uh, policies on our precious women. I mean, what is distinctive in many ways about Iran other than giving the world the greatest poetry is also the levels of literacy, 90 some percent literacy, vast majority of those in the universities, women. This is, this is quite historically distinctive. There's no way that you're going to impose an authoritarian project on folk who gain access to language and this kind of critical reflection that goes with the access to the language. There's a lot of critical reflection going on to people who, are, who don't have access to literacy. We know that. But lo and behold, once you get the overflowing of the connection with other voices around the world, you get that distinctive value of cosmopolitanism, internationalism, and a humanism that's been distinctive in Iran. And I experienced it when I was a graduate student at Princeton. When I was a graduate student at Princeton, we had some Iranian brothers in the engineering department who read Dostoevsky, Chekhov, uh, Turgenev, Steinbeck. They would read them. They, they were cosmopolitans across the board, and they knew the history of black music, 
They knew Martin King. They knew Malcolm X. They knew Angela Davis. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. You know, Angela Davis actually is writing a blurb for my beloved wife's book, A Dusty Relics, along with Wally Soyenka. You know, Soyenka, the greatest Nobel, the great Nobel Prize laureate, writing a blurb. What meaning what? Connecting the struggle, the glorious struggle of Iranians with black folk, Africans, all of those folk who suffer, be they in Asia, be they in Europe, be they in Latin America. That's the best of who the species is. Now, I speak as a Christian, and as a Christian for me, every flag is under the cross. And that cross signifies unarmed truth, unarmed truth and unapologetic love for everybody, beginning with the wretched of the earth, beginning with the oppressed, beginning with the subjugated, you see. And uh, I get excited in talking about the, uh, the great literary and intellectual traditions of uh, the Persians as it connects to Iran, because it's a, uh, it's a beautiful thing, given the bleakness of our world at, at, in the present time. Yeah, there is a very famous picture of uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Remember, they're raising oh, their yes. fist in the yeah. uh, 1966 uh, Summer Mexico Olympics. City. Yeah, uh, same thing happening in Iran. Um, athletes, artists are coming up against That's the true. government. That's true. Um, you are also wrong. a movie star. How do you relate to this? No, indeed. Well, one is, you know, in our market-driven culture that celebrities have a, not just a high visibility, but they have a legitimacy. So when they take a stand, it has repercussions and implications far beyond those who are not in the public eye. You see? So that when Tommy Smith and John Carlos or Muhammad Ali or Althea Gibson, these highly uh, uh, publicly acclaimed figures took political stances, everybody had to take notice. So it is today with Iran. The actors, the actresses, right? the athletes, the soccer teams and so forth, they're on the national and international stage. And when they take a stand, put that tweets, news report, people take notice and it does have an impact. But it's a question really of, um, of moral and spiritual courage. I think in the end, it always goes back to shattering cowardliness, shattering callousness, shattering indifference. The great Rabbi Heschel used to say what? Indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. We gotta say that to the US press. Are you being too indifferent to the evil right now in Iran? Shatter that indifference. Where is the cameras? Tell the stories. Highlight the narratives. Where is the voices? Keep track of the humanity. And that's true across the board. You see it in Ukraine. It's a beautiful thing. We need to focus on the suffering in Ukraine. There's no doubt about that. We need to suffer. We need to focus on the suffering in the West Bank, in Gaza, under Israeli occupation. We need to keep the focus on the suffering of Jews in France. We need to keep the focus on the suffering of the Roma, the so-called Gypsy peoples, and the Dalit, so-called untouchables. We have to be consistent across the board. But in being consistent. It means that we're going to end up calling into question a lot of the narrow ideological lens through which too many of us, too many of the press, too many of the politicians view the world. So that's sort of, sort of the suffering in Iran, the afterthought, the suffering in Ukraine every night in the press. Where's the consistency? A precious baby in Tehran has exactly the same value as a precious baby in Kiev or a precious baby in Washington, D.C. or Chicago or Brazil or South Africa or China. Uh, speaking of uh, role of women uh, leaders, as you mentioned, like Rosa Parks, uh, Maya Angelou, Susan B. Anthony, we just name it, we have so many of them. They fought for this, uh, what we were just discussing as a part of the civil rights suffrage. How do you see the lesson learned from them? Because uh, as we study the history, there were some backlash. Women were left out of the civil rights movement and they came back to, um, to the suffrage. Uh, to get their rights. Do you see any lessons that now Iranian women, they're in forefront of this, uh, 
Mm. Do you see any parallel, any lessons could be learned uh, from that? Well, I know in the black freedom movement, patriarchy has in many ways uh, forced the movement to fight with one arm with the other arm behind his back. Uh, Ella Baker is one of the greatest uh, leaders, one of the greatest figures in the black freedom movement of the 20th century. She was executive director of, of SNCC. She also worked with Martin Luther King Jr. She ended up fighting for the independence of Puerto Rico with the legacy of Abisos Campos and others. And she would always say, you know, you have to have leaders who are willing to give of themselves irregardless of gender, irregardless of sexual orientation and so forth. And patriarchy has served as a major impediment that doesn't allow the unleashing of the possibility and potential of the movement. Now, the history of Iran is one in which the women seize positions anyway because of their tremendous talent and genius and so on, you see. And right now, we're experiencing more and more that focus on the ugly patriarchal face of the Islamic Republic with all of its repressive and oppressive, I would even say fascist policies, you see. But that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. That the, the, the issue of women, life, freedom is one in which you shatter the patriarchy the best that you can, but you connect it to the dignity of working people. You connect it to the dignity of peasants. You connect it to the dignity of the urban poor. You connect it to the dignity of all human beings, and you call for their dignity and freedom across the board. So it's a point of entry. It's not a point of, 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 uh, that concludes an analysis. Patriarchy begins the analysis that then opens its way into embracing all human beings who are suffering, both in Iran and around the world. And we've got magnificent, um, you know, Iranian women intellectuals, women leaders who understand that. You know, my beloved wife understands that as well. But uh, the, my main point here is that the uh, patriarchy is, is, is a vicious thing. It's inside of all of us. It's inside of women. It's inside of men. Just like white supremacy is inside of black people. It's inside of white people, it's inside of all human beings who've come under the influence of both Europe and America, and that has been, of course, hegemonic for so hundreds of years, so we have to fight it every day, every day. Homophobia is inside of us. You know, anti-Jewish, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim elements are all inside of us, given the fact that we're affected by the West. The West has the best in terms of its concerns of freedom, dignity, the West has the worst in terms of its vicious crimes against humanity, especially tied to its military apparatuses. Do you uh, think that the civil rights movement changed the relationship between uh, men and women, as we now discussing in Iran because of the, as you mentioned, Zanz in the Gyoza, the women life freedom. It probably, when we see, we hear from people inside Iran, they sense that this difference, the uh, different perception of their uh, opposing gender, how they look at the woman, how they look at their sisters. As you know, there were some issues with honor killings, uh, all of those crazy things that were right. still going on right. in some parts of Iran. But the movement seems that is changing that uh, culture. Now, do you see any uh, parallel of what happened back in civil rights movement? And after that, in terms of how women and uh, men uh, look at each other. Mm. Yeah, when you think of the history of the black freedom movement and the role of the Harriet Tubmans and Ida B. Wells Barnett's and Angela Davis's and Ella Baker's, uh, and on the cultural side, the Aretha Franklin's, the Nina Simone's, people could see self-respect, self-confidence, self-assertion, will never go back to those old patriarchal modes. We were told to be silent and deferential. And in that sense, the women's movements and the uh, civil rights movements went hand in hand. And the 
people said, well, the feminism was infected by civil rights movement. Well, you always had strong women in the movement, so it didn't have to wait, but it became much more apparent. I think that that's very much the case in the uh, present moment in, in Iran, that it's very clear that the women, the sisters, are uh, the vanguard. And the brothers are there. The brothers are being shot. Brothers are being executed. Brothers are, 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 are part of the resistance. But it's women, life, freedom. You see, that's, that's new. That's powerful. Now, if you go back again to the poetry of our, poetry of our dear sister Farouk, <laughs> you read new, Rebirth. She lays it out for you. You read some of her poetry, she lays it out for you, you see, and she's not the only one. But it's a matter of not talking about women in an isolated way, that they're part of the community, they're part of a tradition, they're part of families, they're part of the history. It's interwoven with men, just like the girls, interwoven with the boys, you see. And we're looking for something egalitarian, and it's actually already there in the depths of the best of the Persian poets and musicians and artists. Jews came to support uh, African Americans during the civil rights movement. Absolutely. Uh, tell us about that and how we can see that, because in Iran we have also issues of minorities, the uh, differences they have. Yeah, I mean, it was a beautiful coming together when you had the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschels and others approach Martin Luther King and Andy Young and Ella Baker and say, as a Jewish brother, as a rabbi, I am basing my witness on a biblical text that said, justice, justice, shall thou pursue. We're spreading hesed, the loving kindness and the steadfast love of oppressed people, no matter what color. And that's what it is to be a Jew. That Judaism is founded on the notion of the tikkun alum, the reforming of the world in light of a commitment to justice and making sure that you're spreading that loving kindness to the orphans and the widows, the fatherless, the motherless. Justice, justice thou shalt pursue. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. That's what the progressive and prophetic Jews brought with them when they embraced Martin King and the Black Freedom Movement. It was a beautiful coming together. Now, of course, Every community, no matter what it is, black, white, Jewish, Catholic, Islamic, Buddhist, Hindu, you've got conservative, you've got lukewarm, you have prophetic. So it was prophetic Jews who took a stand. The deeply conservative Jews were over against Heschel, putting him down. Very, very critical of him. Lukewarm appreciation, but didn't want to participate in the middle, you see. And so that coming together of blacks and Jews was a magnificent thing, because both groups are so hated. Jews hated for 2,000 years with the vicious attacks and pogroms leading up to the Holocaust in the 20th century. And black folk hated for 400 years. Uh, uh, so that coming together was beautiful, but they're human beings. And any time human beings come together, you're going to have some tensions. You're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some incongruities, a lot of anxieties. And it has to be worked out in any movement. Very much so. Yeah, the same thing. The government in Iran has tried to push the minority, religious minorities, ethnic minorities, push away to say that you need to stay away from politics. To just, I mean, if you want to have an easy life, don't uh, talk just, about these things. Yeah, yes. But that was why it was very important uh, 13 years ago to stand with our precious Baha'i brothers and sisters. You see, uh, I would do the same thing with Jehovah Witnesses and so many people, so many places around the world. You know, the great prince was Jehovah Witness the great artist, the mus musician. And so he and I had a lot of discussions about standing up for the Jehovah Witness. And he actually loved the Baha'i as well. You know, Dizzy Gillespie, the great jazz musician, was Baha'i. And uh, uh, the Prince would study uh, a number of these, these, these artists who took stances in light of their religious beliefs. And, uh, and again, it's a matter of moral consistency, really. But in the end, you know, we just have to have a solidarity regardless of the consequences. That's the thing. These days, you know, a lot of people don't want to take stances because they figure they won't have access to money. They won't have access to status. They won't have access to moves in their career. And you say, we understand that human beings are human beings. But 
if no one takes a stand based on principle and moral and spiritual integrity, then what happens to the movement? What happens to the struggles? What happens to the species? It goes under. It goes under. And that's what we're reminded by with the great poets. When we talk about the civil rights movement, the first thing comes to mind is the nonviolent nature of the uh, fight. Uh, what we see now in Iran is a discussion of how we're going to survive from this level of brutality. Should we respond the same way that the government is doing? And some people say, you're not going to win this if you fight back violently. Do you think the nonviolent is still relevant facing a government like well, I, th I think that you always pursue nonviolent means as far as it will go because violence itself tends to be a spiraling phenomena that becomes just eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth and we all end up blind, we all end up toothless. There's no doubt about that. At the same time, though, there's the challenge of Nelson Mandela. And I remember when I sat down and talked with him uh, and you remember he had pursued nonviolence as far as he could and decided that it was not just ineffective, but it was impotent, it was powerless. And he said, we'll move now toward a violence that would focus on property and not people. And that's what the spirit of the nation was about with Nelson Mandela. In that sense, Nelson Mandela is very different than Bishop Tutu, who's my dear brother who recently passed. And uh, um, in fact, we got a new article on him in the Boston Review with Sister, Sister Peel. It's a beautiful reflection on the legacy of Tutu. But then, but he was different than Martin King. You see, Nelson Mandela and King were very different in that regard. King would never opt for violence. He was an absolute pacifist in that way. See, I'm not an absolute pacifist. I do believe there are conditions under which there's justified violence. In the name of Hit against Hitler, I would have fought. You see, there's a chance to fight Stalin, I would have fought. Pol Pot, I would have fought. If the Klan were the only oppositions, I would have to fight. So I'm in a different tradition. I'm with Martin as far as I can go. But if it looks as if every possible nonviolent option is called into question, then just war, which is what governments do. Just war. Those are very, very unique circumstances under which you have a uh, uh, defense of just war, you see. But you do have to keep that open, it seems to me, just as a philosophical position as well as a political option. Uh, and one has to be very, very delicate about these kinds of issues because justice, because violence is not a plaything. It's very, very ugly. It's the worst impulse in our species to want to kill somebody, you see. Uh, and yet, we recognize that um, against the Hitlers of the world, you have to go to war. And so I understand that struggle going on with my precious uh, Iranian brothers and sisters. You know, if you conclude that uh, the, the government is Hitler-like, then you're going to end up with some folk opting for something beyond nonviolence. You know, I can understand that. But you had to be very careful in, in defining it. You really do. I would love to see a major split in the clergy. That's what I want to see in Iran. And say, we are no longer going with the repressive elites. We're siding with the people. I want to see a split in other sectors, in the military, in the police. We're not going to shoot our precious kids down. We're not going to execute our kids anymore. We refuse orders. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It's like the 15,000 Russian brothers and sisters who are going to jail rather than participating in this vicious war against the precious Ukrainians, you see. Or it'd be some of the precious Israeli soldiers who go to jail rather than repress the Palestinians. That's moral conscience, taking a stand even among those who are on the side of the powerful. See, the powerful can have a conscience. And we, want, we, we need to see more of that in other places around the world, including Iran. Right now, there is a big issue of uh, coming together. Uh, the government in Iran has tried to 
make a divisive uh, approach toward people outside of Iran have no uh, moral standing to talk about what is happening in Iran. And people in Iran cannot have relationship with the people outside because of the labels that they put on them, the American CIA agents and those things that you know. How you think uh, this world could be brought down and people out of millions of people, millions of Iranians living outside of Iran in the United States, in Europe, other countries, that these are the result of policies that pushed these people outside of the country. Absolutely. How do you think the, these people can brought back together the trust between Iranian outside of Iran and inside Iran? Yeah, I think that as people see leaders and statespersons of tremendous integrity, who are willing to suffer based on the principles that they have. That generates a trust in leaders. See, that's what happened with Martin King and Malcolm X and Ella Baker, you see. The Black Panther Party loved Martin Luther King Jr. even though they had deep disagreements with him. My mother, a magnificent black Christian woman, she loved Malcolm X even though she was not a follower of Malcolm X. Why? She knew he said what he meant, meant what he said. He had sincerity and integrity. He wasn't selling his soul. He wasn't going to sell other people out. There was a moral and a spiritual standard that they met. That's what we need to see in the Iranian community. Who do we know who loves the people enough to tell the truth about the Islamic Republic, about Israel, about America, about Asia, consistently across the board, not trying to move engage in some kind of a chess move to push people against the wall but because they believe in the truth and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. That's what is needed. And usually there's a few who do come forth. And I know given the rich history of Iran, oh, we got some visionary and courageous Iranian young brothers and sisters who understand the legacy of Rima, understand the legacy of Farouk, understand the legacy of Rumi. These are not just isolated icons. They are alive in the tradition, in the culture, and they had a moral and spiritual greatness that our leaders can learn from. That's how you bring folk together. But without that kind of trust, without that kind of reliability, then you end up with everybody jockeying and the egos and the narcissism and all of the fighting that goes on among the mediocres who are trying to gain access to visibility in a moment of such overwhelming catastrophe and crisis. Uh, uh, but I have great confidence in the Iranian people and the Persian people, I really do. There's, there, there's a greatness there that can never be crushed with the Romans and the Greeks and the Mongolians and the Arab invasions trying to crush their culture, somehow it bounced back over and over again. How does Farsi still go on given those invasions? What is it about these Persian peoples? Ah, what a legacy. Uh, when we talk about the civil rights movement, always we think about Martin Luther King as a uh, visionary leader and as you know we we're just discussing we always refer to one or two or three people who are at top of the uh, movement uh, but what is happening in Iran right now because of the oppression and basically there is no political parties active in Iran there is no freedom of uh, speech uh, we see a network of uh, groups people uh, coming together coordinating uh, protest strikes everything uh, do you think this would be something feasible the, the movement the revolution can succeed without having a single uh, leader as someone we're just discussing as Martin Luther King well I think you have to have a wave of leaders I don't believe in isolated single leaders but you have to have a wave of visionary and courageous voices and figures who are willing to tell the truth, who are willing to suffer on behalf of the people in order for the suffering of the people to become more highly visible. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and that's what we had in the Black Freedom Movement. Because you got to keep in mind, I mean, 
For 244 years, we had the most barbaric slavery. You see, the Frederick Douglasses and the Harriet Tubmans, uh, you know, they're, they're under levels of repression that we can't even conceive of. And then after that, Jim and Jane Crow for another hundred years of neo-slavery, where there's lynching every two and a half days, some black child or woman or man is hanging from some tree, that strange fruit that Billie Holiday sang about with such power, the Jewish brother Maripol writing the lyrics, the strange fruit, the body is swaying in the southern breeze, and yet somehow we still came up with a wave of leaders. Uh, and then now, after, you know, as, as after in the 1960s. Now we got black presidents and black elected officials and black professors and black doctors and lawyers and so forth. It's a beautiful thing, but if they don't have the same courage, they just end up being peacocks in the empire that make the empire more colorful and to hide and conceal the suffering of precious poor black peoples in hoods dealing with housing that's indecent and educational systems that are decrepit. And so you end up with the shining and the glitz of the black elites, but the precious everyday people that Sly Stone sang about with such power, they still catching hell. Their backs are still against the wall. That's what you don't want in Iran. That's what you don't want anywhere else in the world, you see. No, you have to have what Curtis Mayfield talked about, which is the people getting ready so that the least of these and workers and poor people are put at the center of one's vision, not just those at the top to somehow represent those catching hell. You see, that's what democracy is in its most radical form. And that again reminds me of the poetry of Nima. We back to Nima, we back to the, we back to Madi Madavi. Intellectual Iranians, uh, I'm sure they know uh, you very well. Uh, some younger generation might know you through your uh, movies, uh, Matrix and those. Mm -hmm. So the, before we uh, let you go, I would like to ask if you want to talk to the young generation of Iranians uh, going on the street, fighting this uh, regime. Do you, would you like to say something to them? Well, there's no doubt that cinema, in many ways, uh, it builds on the great poetic legacies of uh, both Persians as well as black folk. And I was blessed to be in Matrix, a number of films. You want any form of communication that touches the hearts, minds, and souls of people, especially young people. For they can, be, they can experience what it is to exercise their imaginations and have a sense of empathy to get beyond the present misery and the present suffering. And film, cinema is certainly one of those. And uh, in any form, I mean, it could be, it could be music, it could be painting. Uh, the end is to create your life as a work of art that goes beyond simply presentation and pours yourself into the world. I was talking to Sister Rita with all of her great wisdom just earlier today. You know. She said, you're pouring yourself into the world to make the world a better place. That's what we're after. See, when I was growing up, Brother Shiloh Baptist Church on the Chaco side of Sacramento, I was told every month, if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you ought to leave a little heaven behind. And the question becomes, how much heaven are we leaving behind in a hellish world? How much heaven in the face of the greed and the hatred and the fear and the manipulation of that fear for exploitative ends and aims. Nobody here to save the world. We can leave it a little better than we found it, leaving that heaven behind. I tell you, I come from a great people, a great people, at our best. Thank you so much. Thank you, my brother. I really appreciate it's that. Blessed. Yes, blessed. Thank you. Blessed.